Since the late 1940s, the Shoney's restaurant chain had grown across the country from its birth as a franchisee of the Big Boy Burger chain to a massive family restaurant empire that spanned across several brands and even into hotels. Their growth was explosive, and so was their revenue, seeing over a billion dollars in sales with over 40,000 employees around the world. But the company has since seen a sharp and dramatic decline. They went from 1,800 locations across several brands all around America in the late 90s to just a little over 60 today. Really, if you haven't heard of the company before, there's a good chance you have no idea they ever existed. I certainly didn't until I came across a perfectly intact abandoned one along Highway 192 in Florida while filming my Outside the Kingdom video. What's up guys, my name is Jake, and in this 81st episode of Abandoned, let's take a look at the insane roller coaster ride that is the Shoney's Restaurant Chain. This episode of Abandoned is sponsored by the Nebula original show Red Atom. Get 40% off an annual Nebula subscription by going to go.nebula.tv slash bright sun films. In 1947, Alex Schoenbaum, the son of a bowling alley owner, had opened his very own business next to his father's. It was a small restaurant known as a parkette drive-in, and it was quite successful fueling his love for the restaurant business. This was compounded even further when he met Bob Wine, the co-founder of the very popular Big Boy Burger Chain. Alex wanted in, and he opened a Big Boy franchise in 1951. At the time, the Big Boy chain had their franchisees name their restaurants after themselves. So he opened it as the Parkette Big Boy Shops, though by 1954, it was renamed to Shoney's Big Boy, after a play on Alex's last name. From this point on, the Schoenbaums continued to expand their number of locations, opening Shoney's Big Boy restaurants all across the Southeast US, even sub-franchising to other companies. By the dawn of the 1970s, the Shoney's name accounted for a third of all Big Boy locations across America. By 1972, however, the Shoney's locations were taking on their own identity, becoming well-known roadside restaurants serving local homestyle dishes in a comfortable and friendly atmosphere. That's what people loved about the company, and with a new CEO by the name of Ray Danner stepping in, Shoney's began dropping the big boy name. With this, they also introduced their own mascot, the Shoney's Bear. Not only was Shoney's becoming their own restaurant brand, but under Danner's leadership, the company was expanding and opening up new chains like Mr. D's Seafood. Actually, for a time, Mr. D's Seafood, which would later be changed to Captain D's, had outgrown Shoney's in the number of locations opened. Danner also emphasized the quality of service, dubbed the Danner's Way a company culture he began installing that promoted clean environments, customer satisfaction, and an overall strive for perfection. Now, this wasn't the only company culture he was implementing, but for a time, this was really good. Many considered him running a tight ship, and this showed in the large amount of repeat customers and overall profit for the company. The brand then identified another area of the market they might be able to serve. Shoney's restaurants were doing particularly well around travel motels, a time when roadside lodging was a little more glamorous. So that influenced the creation of the Shoney's Inn, a new hotel chain created by the company along with a new upscale restaurant called Fifth Quarter Steakhouse. The subsidiary quickly grew to 21 locations by the late 70s, and while it wasn't producing the same profits as the core restaurant business, it was succeeding in getting the Shoney's brand name more recognizable around America. By now, that Shoney's name had been proudly held high across hundreds of restaurants and hotels in 29 states from the west to east coasts. But still, Shoney's was a franchisee of the Big Boy Corporation, and in a weird position where their name and dining concept alone was bringing in new customers. They didn't need Big Boy anymore, and didn't need the royalty payments as well as the territorial restrictions that came with their partnership. So they went to court to get out of their agreement with Big Boy, which by this point was owned by the Marriott Corporation. They successfully did so in 1984, but not without paying Marriott around $13 million for a complete separation of the two brands. Shoney's didn't have a problem paying this though, as they saw how successful their locations had been doing. 
By now, the company had reached record sales of over $269 million across 939 restaurants. Truly a behemoth of a restaurant company. Continuing with the theme of independence, they also severed their ties with KFC, another smaller franchise relationship they also had. In doing so, they took the opportunity to buy their competitor outright, a then-struggling fast-food chicken restaurant called Famous Recipe. In just a few years, Shoney's was able to turn the chain around and grow it to over 220 locations. Over in the mainline Shoney's restaurants, fresh concepts were being implemented to win over new customers, like the introduction of the all-you-can-eat breakfast bar. By all accounts, Shoney's was a tightly managed restaurant powerhouse, and had yet to see an unprofitable quarter through the 1980s. A recapitalization in the finance structure just bolstered their strong assets, and that allowed them to pay out fat dividends to shareholders. A new CEO was brought in by the late 1980s, and profit was climbing to impressive levels. In the business community, Shoney's was highly regarded for their corporate structure and clean balance sheets, a fact that served them very well in the stock market. In fact, other companies wanted them. The parent company behind the Perkins restaurant chain made an attractive bid to buy the entire company's southern operations for $93 million. The deal never went through, though. But really, that was fine considering the steady increase of revenue. So really, executives saw nothing but smooth sailing ahead. Though, that wouldn't exactly match reality. In 1989, a bombshell lawsuit was filed in Florida. It stated that Shoney's Incorporated had systematically discriminated against African Americans by limiting job opportunities and straight up cultivating a racist environment in their restaurants. This was alleged to come from a long-standing culture of racist hiring practices across the chain, only hiring African Americans who weren't customer-facing with claims that this racist workplace culture came right from the top specifically naming then-chairman Ray Danner. Obviously, Shoney's fought back against this, with a spokesperson saying, quote, I want to empathetically say that the general allegations do not reflect the way the company operates. Shoney's plans to vigorously defend itself against such allegations. Those were fighting words, but things did not get better for the company during this lawsuit, as Shoney's former CEO, David Watchtell, had seemingly turned on the company's current lead, Ray Danner, stating that in 1982, he recalled Danner contemplating giving money to the KKK, and then later, during a deposition with Danner himself, he was asked if he had ever used racial slurs when referring to African Americans. Danner replied, I can't say I haven't. So yeah, this was obviously a horrible and truly disgusting look for the entire company. And in 1992, Shoney's had settled the lawsuit for $105 million, with Dana resigning from the company and forfeiting his $65 million worth of stock. Many would come to Danner's defense and shared their experiences with the CEO. But still, the damage was done, and it was the largest racial discrimination lawsuit at the time. With a very damaged reputation from the scandal, leadership began exploring new ways to freshen up the company. Shoney's embarked on a few campaigns not only to be more inclusive and diverse, but also philanthropic. Shoney's was also expanding with hundreds of new locations across all of their brands, with the ultimate goal to dominate the family restaurant segment. At least that's what their CEO of the time wanted. The financial health of the company was also doing quite well, despite the lawsuit. The company cracked the billion dollar mark in sales in 1993, and earned a healthy $46 million in profit. This was all while the company paid off some of its expansion debt, once again strengthening their overall bottom line. This freed up some other cash to further invest into their new locations, both adding new ones and remodeling existing restaurants. But then sales were beginning to stagnate, as was their stock price. In fact, both were beginning to drop by the mid-90s. The company took away its dividend for shareholders in 1997, causing their stock price to slip even further. Sales overall held steady, but income was slipping into the negatives. To combat this, Shoney's replaced their CEO and subsequently sold off their famous recipe restaurant chain, using some of that cash from the sale to buy out their largest Shoney's franchisee. 
But still, the company closed more and more unprofitable locations, and by the end of 1998, they had lost more than $100 million. Despite revenue of $1.2 billion, the company was very quickly running out of cash on hand. With their stock price taking a massive hit and investors concerned, a proxy battle was initiated by shareholders. Another new CEO was instituted, as well as other new board member seats to calm the shareholders. 72 additional locations were announced to be closed, but at this point, it seemed like it was a little too late. Liquid cash was running out, and their stock price dropped below a dollar a share just as they were delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Customers were feeling the heat too, claiming that in-store food quality had sharply declined once the company entered its turmoil, and this of course caused less people to visit their locations and spend less money. This was happening in over 1,800 locations across the world. The quick turnaround with senior management left a confused and directionless corporate structure, all while their vast number of locations were in desperate need of maintenance. By the year 2000, the company was on life support, and really on the verge of bankruptcy. While it has been reported that they did succumb to their critical financial wounds, Shoney's never actually declared bankruptcy. They were just very close to, with over $250 million in debt. The company had been suffering a bad reputation, and with hundreds of restaurants all across the country in need of some TLC, it would take a massive injection of capital to get the company back to a positive state. Finally, in 2002 though, a lifeline was given to the corporation. Of course, there's really a common theme on who provides funding to a stricken company like this. And that's, say with me, private equity. Yeah, so a Texas-based firm called Lone Star Funds had acquired the entire company for just $20 million, or paying 33 cents a share. That's pretty astonishing to buy an entire restaurant company that had multiple brands, over 1,800 locations, and had revenue over a billion dollars just a few years prior. All for just $20 million. Now, to be fair, this company would also be absorbing their remaining $135 million in debt, but this firm had some experience in turning around dying brands. However, when they acquired Shoney's, they chose to massively downsize their reach. Over a five-year period, the company would go from around 1,000 restaurants between mainline Shoney's and Captain D's around the world to just 270 by 2006. It was already a dramatic downsizing from the 1,800 locations back in the 90s, but now their brand reach was diminishing. Lone Star ultimately sold off their largest asset from the sale, that being Captain D's. Shoney's mainline restaurants was now the only asset remaining, since by this point, all of their other subsidiary brands were shuttered or sold off in pieces. It seemed Lone Star was also ready to dump the brand as on the first day of 2007, Lone Star announced they had sold the Shoney's company to a private individual named David Davidpour. It was an interesting sale, as this was going from a private equity firm to a private individual, willing to take on the entire company as a new acting CEO. Now, David had some experience through his investment company in the restaurant business before, having a hand in Church's Chicken and Lone Star Steakhouse. Uh-oh. Still, though, he definitely seemed confident. Though, Shoney's restaurants continued to close all over America, and by now, most of the international locations had long been shuttered. Over the next few years, a bunch of new changes were implemented, like new menu items and a new location serving as a concept for the future of the brand, offering beer and wine at a bar, along with their first presence inside a shopping mall. Davenport stated in 2014 that he was hoping for at least 100 new franchises to open by 2019. That definitely didn't go to plan. Shoney's today is really a shell of its former self. Through the 2010s, the company went through a pretty extensive rebranding campaign, an attempt to change their image for the better and market the restaurants as a trendy bar and grill, something more akin to Applebee's or TGI Fridays, while also sprinkling in some American heritage and family values. Shoney's also leaned more into who was driving the bus, with a whole section on their website just juicing up their CEO, David Davenport. Meet David Davenport. 
the businessman who bought Shoney's personally because he believes it's an American icon that deserves to be returned to its former glory. Since that point, the company has almost entirely focused on franchise growth, trying to attract new restaurant investors to buy into the Shoney's name. Shoney's is growing, and we're developing new markets right now. This is America's next great success story. You can help us write it. However, the company was ranked number 6 out of 10 of the worst franchises to buy in America by Forbes. To combat this and attract new investors, the company introduced a new look called V2020. And it's exactly what you think it looks like. Pretty generic, flat, and lifeless. Though it was seen as a positive direction for the brand, at least from where they had been. But clearly it wasn't the revolutionary change the company was hoping for. From the 270 locations back in 2007, today there are just 63 locations left by my count. All of which are either in the process of rebranding to the new and modern look, or they're closing altogether. And really, that's not that surprising with the mediocre reviews that are found basically across the chain. What's left from all of these closures back in the late 90s and early 2000s was a landscape of dead restaurants. The incredible and rather ruthless downsizing meant that hundreds of Shoney's restaurants would close across the country, some with very little notice. This one in Morgantown, West Virginia was one of the later casualties. It closed sometime after 2013 and for nearly a full decade sat completely abandoned, with weeds consuming the facade and the interior in shambles. The booths and tables were left behind as the plants wilted and the fully stocked kitchen began to rust away. It was a depressing sight really and that location was far from alone. Another was the one that I remember back on Highway 192 near Disney World. It was the one that got me fascinated in the company. While Shoney's did open up another location down the highway, that being the only one left in Florida, this restaurant sat abandoned for years with everything left behind. It was ultimately turned into another restaurant like so many others. At this point, the hundreds of locations that closed through the 90s and early 2000s have long been demolished or repurposed. Though there are some abandoned relics of the once powerful chain still around. When you zoom out and look at this whole story, it's pretty surprising how little is remembered about this brand. Most who remembered it back from the 50s to the 70s see it primarily as a part of the big boy chain. Perhaps there was a loyal base of customers in the South who remember the country-style cooking that went on there through the 80s, but I'm not sure many people really cared about it after that. The scandal that plagued the company in the early 90s was a very negative and dirty stain on their iconic rise. Not long after that, their profits took a hit, and their nearly 2,000 locations across America just weren't bringing in the numbers they once were. Saddled with debt from expansion and no way to pay it off, the company was on life support. An investment firm took advantage of that and purchased the truly enormous restaurant chain for literally pennies on the dollar. From there, the company was cannibalized to the point where it is today, merely a chain of 63 locations that serve mediocre food in a mediocre atmosphere. While the other brands that grew alongside Shoney's, like Lee's Famous Chicken and Captain D's, all occupy a decent presence still, the same cannot be said for the mainline Shoney's brand. And it's weird how little it's talked about or remembered now. I mean, just researching this video was shockingly hard for how big of a presence it had in the American restaurant business. Now, there are many more locations around America that are abandoned than actually operating. If you watch my videos, there's a good chance you have interest in our world's history. I obviously do, and for years, I have always had an interest in the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Well, recently, I've been learning about the context with everything that led up to that point, and I've been doing that through Real Time History's brilliant show, Red Atoms. It's a great series that illustrates the timeline of atomic development within the Soviet Union and the mass movement to catch up to America. I learned a great deal of new information from this show that can only be found on Nebula. 
Nebula is a creator-made and creator-run platform where you can find original shows from your favorite online creators. My channel is also there with all of my videos ad-free and released a few days before they do here on YouTube. There's also now Nebula Classes, unique high-quality courses to learn from your favorite content creators. All of this is included with a Nebula subscription, and if you want to get 40% off an annual subscription for yourself, you can use my special link Go .nebula.tv slash brightsomefilms. Using that link, you can get a subscription that comes out to just a little over $2.50 a month. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.